Well, as a journalist, Facebook kind of becomes a universal phone book. It's a way to find people and reach them, have some form of contact, and that's helped us in many ways. Twitter is like a tip sheet. If I go look for what's being listed under Libya, there's a pretty good chance I'll find something that I would have missed if I had just been using the wires or hadn't been seeing some of the analysis, taking the temperature. I think, uh, I wouldn't say there's a risk involved, but you have to be aware, especially as a journalist using these platforms, that you're only getting a particular cross-section of the society, this cross-section of mostly young and all tech-savvy people. And that means that if you're listening to Twitter exclusively, you might be blowing that perspective out of proportion. But then again, it's a bitty, bit, pretty big part of that proportion. The Arab world is incredibly young, more than half of the population under 30 years old, and a lot of them on Facebook, hundreds of millions now is what I've heard at most recent count. Uh, but it's very hard for us to do without it now that we've gotten used to this tool. When we were in Egypt, we had no internet for several days. It was very hard. I was tweeting on a satellite phone, sometimes with help of friends in Dubai. And you get the sense that in those days, everybody had to do things the old fashioned way through phone numbers when we could get through. Sometimes cell phones were blocked. And other times we're, I was interviewing people who were intimately involved in those Facebook pages. And when the, when the internet went down, they had to use pen and paper. They had to do phone chains. They, did, uh, they handed out flyers. And it reminded us that there was a time before Facebook. And in that time before Facebook, there were revolutions. So it's not the be all and end all. This was not the Twitter revolution. This is not the Facebook revolution. These are just ways that people found connective tissue across society. And then they used those connections to do what they wanted to do as a group. The idea that a country could shut off the internet was inconceivable before this year. Nobody knew they even could do that. And when Egypt did it, it was a shock to the system, shock to the economy. It cost them $90 million. I remember standing, waiting to check into my hotel in Cairo and getting upset at the man behind the counter because it was taking so long until I realized he was using a dial-up credit card swipe, the old-fashioned way, to check me in. I said, poor guy, I mean, he's figuring out how to do his job all over again a, a century before, or at least a few decades before. So I think you can, but you can shut that all off at a very high cost. Where there's internet, there's a way to reach these platforms. Where there's no internet, there's a high cost to society. And very few governments have been willing to shut it off completely. I think we saw what we saw in Syria was interesting, that they actually tried to release some of the controls on Facebook and Twitter. They announced it. I haven't spoken to people there to know how much freer it is to access those pages. But that was interpreted across the board as a sign of confidence by the Assad regime, that they feel comfortable enough to unleash those platforms. Again, people wondering very cynically, not just in Syria, but across the world, are these platforms being used as surveillance mechanisms to watch who comes out of the woodwork and engages these groups? Very, very little way for us to know. But we do know that governments find them very dangerous most of the time. We already know Libya was in part enabled by the internet. It was an internet-enabled revolution just like all the other ones we've seen. And uh, what, I've, what I've sensed speaking to people involved in the planning as we look for interviews and speak to members of the opposition is that in Libya it seems like there were digital activists inside the country, but more than in other parts of the Middle East, it was at least a 50-50 divide between Libyans in Libya and Libyans abroad who collaborated. And in that case, social media became a platform for them to connect, empower each other, enable each other. We see opposition members, uh, so many of them have left Libya for obvious reasons, for reasons of personal safety. And they live abroad now, and they've done everything they can to leverage the internet as a way for them to, to help the people inside Libya get information out and get their planning done and get knowledge transfer. And we know from speaking to activists that there's knowledge transfer, that Tunisians emailed Egyptians and helped them figure out how do you avoid tear gas? How do you take out a tank? How do you plan? You know, it's not just inspiration, it's information that's traveling across these lines. I wrote an article a year ago and the opening line was that Pan-Arabism may have died a long time ago, but it's alive in some form on the web. 
more than in generations, we see a regional consciousness and it's online. hard to say. It depends on the subject. The best part about Twitter and Facebook is that it's fragmented. So I follow over a thousand people on Twitter. I have friends in the media, friends in PR who say, no, no, you should only follow 10 or 20 people. You should be very exclusive. And I think that's ridiculous. The reason I'm on Twitter more than conveying my own insights is to listen to what people have to say. It's hard to say because it's cumulative. You know, you might check it every once in a while. I'll check my app messages to see if someone I've never heard of had a great idea that they wanted to get across. Frankly, if I could change one thing about Twitter, I would let anybody send you a direct message. Because what's the harm? That's what it's like on Facebook. Anybody can reach you with a message. And that's, I think, the message of social media is we can reach each other even if we don't know each other and you're freer to connect on Twitter than anywhere else. And we've seen Twitter take the place of blogs in many ways. When people have something to say, they can go there. You know, I now have 20,000 plus followers who want to know what I have to say, and I appreciate that, and I feel an obligation. When I haven't tweeted in a while, I wonder, you know, well, is there something I'm seeing that people would want to know? Because they followed me, because they assume if there's something worth knowing, I'll say it. Certainly in my own sphere of view. So this is how it becomes part of our lives, and we get used to it.